our our plan of work. So I think starting now in 2015, 2019, with the new government, this commitment is really more clear. They already stipulated in the third national reform plan that is 2005, 2015, 2019. Next slide. So with that commitment, uh, the government, uh, led by Papanas, that is my former ministry that I work for, uh, has uh, worked closely with the DGGI, that is Global Green Growth Institute, uh, which established in 2011, 2012, where Indonesia is only members. Right now, our former president, uh, SBY, Bambang Susilo Yudhoyono, is uh, becoming the chairman of that uh, uh, institute. So together with uh, GGGI, uh, Bapanas has already uh, prepared a so-called roadmap for green growth uh, initiative. That is the green growth for prosperous Indonesia. So basically, this uh, roadmap has been developed and outlines opportunities, methodologies, and priority action. How that we can move toward this uh, green growth concretely in our development. Next slide. So, with that uh, documents, we will see that group shouldn't focus on short, only short-term opportunities. For growth orphans, we have to see really a long-term problem, issues, we can tackle that. We know that moving toward green, there is always a cost short-term, but we have to see the benefit of this initiative in the long-term exercise. Many private sector always uh, reluctant to move on this uh, short-term initiative because of the cost that has, be, has to be borne for moving on this uh, uh, <coughs> initiative on the field. So, uh, what is the final out outcome that we want to see while uh, with moving on this uh, green field? First, certainly, the of realizing the development in the ideals and part is going to be more in 2030. I have the book about equitable and sustainable green food. Mr. Raswati, can you help me with this book? The book. Ladies and gentlemen, the strategies and policy include three main issues, namely, first, concerning transformation in economic toward the use of the renewable natural resources, second, concerning low emission development cooperation, third, concerning support needed in the implementation of low emission development. Ladies and gentlemen, East Kalimantan has faced various less sound and qualified economic development phases. The increase include rate from 7.42% in the timber period and 1972 5.14% in oil and gas era and 2008 caused increase in unemployment rate to more than 10 percent. Furthermore, the decline in economic growth rate due to shift in the economic base from oil and gas which potential has declined to coal has generated the highest percentage uh, of unemployment in the economic history of East Kalimantan, namely amounted to 12.33% in 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, by extracting major resources to drive economic growth, East Kalimantan become the third class carbon emitting problem in Indonesia after Central Kalimantan and Riau. Majority 
of East Kalimantan Emission Steam from Forest Corporation and other land trees. Wild forces and relative emission are relatively small forces corporation are driven by palm oil, mining, forestry and agriculture and grid emission via this pollution, forest degradation, fires and the draining of peatland. And gentlemen, for the purpose of supporting the national government, uh, government will be reduce carbon emission in 2010. The government of East Kalimantan proven along with all community elements declare the green last East Kalimantan green Talking. Green is Kalimantan is a condition in East Kalimantan. So we have uh, 100 villages have been trained for what we call CIMAP. It's kind of a financial accounting system that you know in in a single this uh, single village in in Barau, they may have a budget from government about a hundred. Uh, 100,000 US dollar. That's about 1.5, 1.4 billion in a single village. In a single village who has about, let's say, 37 households in like Longdubo, in a village in, 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 in Barau. So you can imagine how the capacity is really need to be enhanced to, I mean, to, 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 to improve their development. So we have what we call uh, so village model in Barau, we have Marabu and Longdohong serve as uh, the, the models. That we believe that by having this kind of models, we can replicate to other larger scale, to other districts, even to uh, other uh, provinces. Next, please. This is the 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 example, really the example how the forest, I mean the, the local governments at the village level can also participate in reducing the emission directly on the ground. You can imagine a, a, a village here like here, a spot in the middle of nowhere in, in East Kalimantan, having access to the internet, they hire they, they have a, they rent a internet connection satellite. And then they, they do what they can what they can do to reduce the emission, they extinguish fires, and then they post it in Facebook. For what? To inspire other villages to do the same thing on uh, uh, the same the same thing the same way as they do in, in, in Marabu. So I think it's a very good uh, example how the capacity can be enhanced to uh, to support the development at, on the ground level. Next please. Reduce impact logging. This is the another another sample, the second sample that we need to we would like to highlight during this session that we have been working with local uh, with with local logging concessions and trying to introduce what we call reduced impact logging carbon. Basically, this is the, almost similar with the real R E R, the uh, reduced impact logging, uh, the ordinary one, but we try to introduce the carbon. I'd like to mention that probably after this, YUD will also uh, talk about this in the next session, and then just uh, after this. So I skip this one, but the point here is we already have the models here, and then need to be replicated to other uh, larger areas to have bigger impacts. Next, please. So regarding the forest management unit, when we work with uh, the logging concessions, we need the forest governance at the ground level. KPH, Forest Management Unit, is a program that are uh, led by uh, district government, initiated by central government, and you know almost all of the forest governance on the ground led by KPH, led by Forest Management Unit. Almost everything, you know, you can see the from certification, from monitoring, forest development, working with community, dealing, engaging with the community. Almost everything we can do on, on the ground with the leadership of Forest Management Unit. So I think this is the, the, 
the, the also another example on how we can also replicate this example to larger scale. Um, they, currently, they currently encourage more licensing and agricultural expansion than they do of increasing productivity and intensification. 40% of central Kalimantan's GDP comes from land use and you can see that somewhere between 700 and 950 million dollars is collected in national government taxes from that every year. But only about 10% goes back to the region itself. So where gas and oil, for example, has generated revenues that flow back to the region, giving them incentives to actually uh, grow their resources and sectors in a more uh, sustainable way, but as well allowing them to benefit from the growth that's taking place, you can see that palm oil is not having anywhere near that kind of impact, certainly not in central Kalimantan. What this also means is that the bulk of businesses are making decisions that are not linked to productivity and local administrators are actually allocating land based on licences and also lands and building taxes, both of which encourage the use of more land, not less. If I can have the next slide please. So why are we advocating a landscape approach? Of course everybody's talking about landscapes and jurisdictions these days and I think one of the unfortunate things is that it's lost a bit of its meaning. But for us, and hopefully for a, a large number of you, we're really talking about a comprehensive approach to the problem of land use. One thing that's really distinguished here is that before RED, I think RED is really a landscape approach now, but where we used to deal with land use issues, it was project by project, and it was very difficult to see aggregated effects or benefits delivered at scale. So one of the essential elements that we're looking at is actually connected pieces of land. What that also means is that you're dealing with ecosystems that have valuable natural assets that should be preserved or rehabilitated and climate the context. But we also need an inclusive green economy to restart economic development to make sure that the development is green to provide the jobs that people need and also as was pointed out by last speakers to improve the lot of the small farm. And frankly I think we cannot do that other than with a fairly complete economy-wide transformation that we are talking about. Now the question is, these are good ideas and they have slightly moved forward, but is there a gap between uh, concept and implementation? And uh, yes, there is. Of course, we would like to be the, like the cyclist in the <coughs> Tour de France race, you know, going straight from the start to the finish and coming first. But the reality is a little bit more like what you see in the second diagram. And the question that we have to ask is that, is this gap just destiny or is it, are we just going to have to face this difference or is there something in the design of the green economy, the design of our green growth strategy that needs to be rethought, that needs to be relooked? And I would probably argue it's the second. Here is why. So firstly, what is the inclusive green economy? It's a set of principles around which a new economy can be designed. And some of these principles already were much talked about in Indonesia and that you are familiar with them in terms of focusing on jobs in the economy. This is taken straight out of the report that my colleagues at UNEP and I have drafted recently to present as UNEP's paper. This was presented in New York in September. Um, we look at an economy-wide transformation because the impacts of policy changes in one area affect another. You cannot have a new energy policy without affecting transportation and without affecting agriculture and vice versa. So we have to look at economy-wide transformation. We have to use dynamic models like the system dynamic model that uh, my colleagues and I have been working with Kalteng Kal and, and also with uh, Bapidas there and also Bapidas. So these are the ways in which we have to approach it. And we have to look at uh, rethinking natural resources, recognizing them placing them right heart and center of the balance sheet of the country which they are, and then seeing what can be best do to provide people jobs and livelihoods through these natural resources, rather than simply convert them into corporate profits. GDP, and people keep forgetting this, GDP is a combination of different incomes. It is profits, it is also wages and salaries, including the wages of workers. It is also net interest for the bankers. It's also net rentals of equipment and depreciation and so on. And somehow, we keep forgetting that it's not just profits, it's all, all these other factors as well. So when you want economic growth, you need to grow all the elements of GDP, and not just the profit element. And without growing all the elements, you will not get GDP growth. 